Welcome back to Between the Levees. I'm joined today by Mr. Dell Wilkins. He is the Vice President of Northern Operations for Canal Barge, the Vice President of Canal Terminal Company, and the President of Illinois Marine Towing, among a few other things that we'll discuss over a 43-year career thus far. Mr. Wilkins, thank you for joining me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, sir. Uh, you came highly recommended by Mr. Mark Canoy. So I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while here. Um, tell me, all these begin the very same way, sir. Where were you born? Well, Tim, I was born on Neville Island, Pennsylvania, which happens to be the longest island on the Ohio River, um, which is in the Pittsburgh region of our country. And uh, what did your parents do for a living? Well, my father um, worked for uh, Travaux Corporation. He worked with the sand and gravel division of the company. My mother was a educator by education, teacher, um, and um, worked in the same industry that my grandfather and his brother had worked in with Travaux Corporation, all in the aggregate part of, the, um, that, of that once formerly mighty company of our industry. Um, so um, that was the route. So growing up on Neville Island, I was able to see barges and, and see what we do as industry from a very young age. What did your father do uh, do for Travaux? He managed um, the Keystone Division um, back channel plant, which is the same plant that was started by my grandfather and his brother, Starling and Walter Wilkins. And they came to Pittsburgh area um, like the Great Migration from the South, from Cal Penn, South Carolina. And they had done that type of work on the Pacolet River um, in South Carolina and started doing that for the Dravot brothers and with the Dravot brothers themselves um, on the back channel of Novo Island and the rest is history. Tell me some more about that, how they migrated up and uh, got into all that business. Well, the Dravot brothers um, were two engineers um, out of Lehigh University, which is also in, in the Pennsylvania region and um, had started Dravot Corporation. Um, and we're basically a contracting and general contracting firm and did a lot of work for um, the maritime community. They had a shipyard. They were doing general contracting. Um, they did a lot of um, construction of locks and dams. Um, they did a lot of co-engineering and just kind of grew. One time, the um, Giroux Corporation was a, over a billion dollar corporation, pretty big and headquartered in, in Pittsburgh. Um, and Pittsburgh at that time had um, was a third leading um, corporate headquarters in the country um, with a lot of Fortune 50 um, and 100 companies in the general region of Pittsburgh and surrounding area, all the major steel mills and uh, and on and on. Um, so they, um, a basic ingredient that the, the Dravot brothers needed um, in their contracting business was concrete. Um, so they had heard, and where do you get sand and gravel? A lot of places around our country, you mine it. Um, with having quarries and mines, and they heard about these two gentlemen in South Carolina that were actually dredging and doing uh, an operation and getting river sand and gravel. Went down, um, saw them, met them, and asked them, hey, come up and start in Pittsburgh, and but we need this material and need this kind of skill. And that's what they did. And, and again, they started and ended up selling their business and being part of the Dravot Corporation, and the rest is history. Indeed. So let's start with the beginning of your history. Tell me about life growing up in uh, the Pittsburgh area. Well, it was great. Now, Pittsburgh um, was a, uh, a great upbringing. Uh, it really was. I, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, industrial city. When growing up, it was a real, uh, it was a steel mill type town. Steel mills lining the rivers, smoky, dingy, um, dirty. Um, a lot of people had coal-fired furnaces in their homes, so you had a lot of soot always floated around Pittsburgh. And we, Pittsburgh had a pretty nasty reputation for being a dirty industrial city, as, as did the region. In fact, when I was a kid, we always joked, you know, if it snowed, we had to get out and enjoy that snow day one, because by day two, it was already gray and, and getting dingy from all the soot and all the blackness and white snow lasted about you know, less than 24 hours in Pittsburgh at the, in those days. So uh, it was always fun. And we didn't know, uh, we didn't have a, uh, 
you know, environmentalist. None of that was really a big thing. And we were just doing what we did, um, trying to make a living and, and enjoying life as a kid. And and um, it was always fun. And we just didn't pay any any mind whatsoever. In fact, I remember, I guess, I don't remember the exact years, but the Cuyahoga River um, in Ohio, near Cleveland, caught on fire. Um, so, And the steel mills were pumping out um, all the steel and and in Pittsburgh, they would dump the slag over the riverbanks. The sky would light up with a big glow from the slag. It was just, that was all part of how you grew up in Pittsburgh. And everybody's parents either worked in the mill or the mine or some type of heavy industry because everything is heavy industry. So that's all the dads did and all the boys and all the kids. We played football, played games, had a pretty fun youth, no doubt. Were, were you drawn to anything specific in school? No, I, was, I um, um, school was great. You know, I mean, Neville Island, I, I we moved to Swickley, and I ended up at Quaker Valley High School in Swickley, and um, from there went to um, work summers um, on the rivers, went into school, um, college, um, went right to University of Pittsburgh, so right, you know, all local. You know, I just had my son go off to school and going out to make visits with him to the various campuses he, he was looking at. And it's a whole different way of doing business. My father basically told me, I don't care where you go, but you can't stay here and don't go work in the steel mill. So, so had pretty strict order. So um, ended up going to college and um, and that was great. And studied, you know, um, business. We didn't have really a, a business minor at Pitt at that time, but um, liberal with business focus as we called it. And so it was, um, ended up working back in the same business that my um, family had worked in, working in with a barge line and working with Trevo and, and um, started moving up um, the ranks from the bottom, from the deck plate, if you will. Tell me about the beginning of that career. Yeah, so I um, worked a couple summers um, trying to earn some money. I well, was kind of funny. Uh, I think it was my freshman year or sophomore, I, you know, wanted to get an internship. So I'm thinking, boy, that'll be nice to get an internship, but work in a nice building downtown, be, you know, doing my thing, you know, and, you know, be like dad, you know, have an opportunity to work in the offices. And um, the next thing I know, I showed up at JNL Steel in Aliquippa. And because um, I had been talking about, well, what do I do, you know, with life? You know, I've seen all my friends, some of them who were going to work in mills, driving brand new cars and this and that. And, and, uh, Showed up at JNL Steel and I was over at the lead vats. And um, that first week, wow, <laughs> that was a rude awakening. Came back and um, dad had one question. So how do you feel about, you know, continuing your education now? Got it, dad. Great move. <laughs> think I'll finish that. Think I'll stick with that. And then who knew then what was going to be the eventual change, you know, the landscape of the steel industry of our country from the integrated mills and coming into specialty mills and foreign competition, a lot of things. But back in those days, we didn't see that, had that vision, but maybe dad was just one step ahead by saying, Hey, you have union workers having 13 weeks paid vacation that might not be sustainable. So maybe you should maybe focus and stick, stick with um, the basics here. So I did and it worked out pretty well. Was your first job out of college at Dravo? Um, actually, no. First job, um, well, first job out of college was um, really with um, U.S. Steel Corporation, working um, in um, like an internship, um, administrative work, and then it quickly um, ended up going to Dravo after mm -hmm. that, um, working um, on the deck plate. I uh, wanted to go back and, you know, work because I was always intrigued with um, the mariners and, and having that exposure working some summers, I said, hey, would it be neat to be able to actually pilot one of these vessels? So I went back and wanted to accomplish that, which I was able to do, blessed to do. And then from there was promoted into um, a traffic assistant position, which at that time we were regulated still by the Waterways Freight Bureau for all the regulated cargoes that we transported, not just by barge, but also by truck and rail regulated commodities and so I uh, did a traffic assistant role and and that was my introduction to management from the deck plate to wheelhouse so I kind of had a little bit of exposure to all positions which has served me well in this wonderful industry that I serve in. 
Tell me a, a little bit about your journey to the wheelhouse. Well, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, um, I mean, brutally honest. It was, it was fun. It was challenging. Um, I wasn't the typical um, deckhand and mariner uh, at that at that time. So there were some um, wheelhousemen who were um, and and leaders who were certainly glad to have me on board and glad to have people willing to put in whatever it took to be the best they could be. And there were others who weren't so proud and happy to have people like me on board. When I say like me, just a horse of a different color, if you will. And so faced those and um, uh, obstacles, but I always looked at it um, the way that I was raised that, you know, I'm no different than anybody. I'm going to hear, work hard, do the job, and I'm going to overcome and demonstrate that I'm just as qualified to do the job as anybody else. And I had a mentor, um, Captain Carol Hines, uh, who was from Novo Island, who knew my family, um, and a couple others who were there who said, hey, we think this young man is you know, really going to do well and got a promotion and he sponsored me to get a promotion up into the uh, mate's position and became a mate, uh, watchman, which was on the back channel, then mate, I'm sorry, mate was on the back channel, watchman on the front channel, uh, front watch rather. Um, so just again, having somebody who said, you know, like any of us, as far as, you know, Mariners takes an interest and gives you uh, a endorsement for the next opportunity. And um, I was ready, prepared, and always took advantage of those opportunities. Next thing you know, from that to, to mate, to that from there to steersman, and then next thing um, in time, had the opportunity to, to navigate um, on the Ohio River, and then the lower um, from 5,600 to 10,500 horsepower vessels running from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. How long did it take you to get from deck to wheelhouse? Boy, Tim, now you're, now, now you're, you know, I'm in that first stage, that's called some timers. And <laughs> I didn't, uh, put the years up, but it was it was quite a few number of years. Maybe fast track by today's standards, or maybe not today's standards, but it was fast track then. Moved pretty quickly. Um, about five years, maybe six years. It wasn't it wasn't that long? Um, because I just it was like a I excelled at navigation. I was able to read the current and 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 pick up the drifts and just it just came natural. Um, like driving a bicycle, I guess. And there was um. Uh, one time, uh, one old captain said, boy, this guy's a crackerjack and um, had never heard that term and still haven't heard it much, but it just came natural. Um, and I watched, a, I watched a lot of other steersmen and even pilots who couldn't pick up that they were drifting or the current had them because of the movements and, and it was too late by the time they picked it up. And I always saw it immediately right away. And so it was, it was just fun. Um, and then... Um, Part of me was sad um, to to actually go into the office uh, when I was asked to do that, but it was again the opportunity to to do it, and I did it. My grandfather always had a saying for all of us: is that it's always be it's always better to be prepared, um, um, and have the opportunity than to have the opportunity and not be prepared. So um, we always try to my brothers and myself always tried to make sure we were always prepared for any opportunity that might come along. And that's how we live life, and still to this day. Well, you said you you at the sticks on, on a ten five. Yes. What's the biggest tow you've ever been behind? Probably about forty five, maybe fifty barges. Um, Captain Homer um, Payton, um, one of that time Dravos, um Union Barge Line's top, you know, lower guys. I mean, he could take anything down the river. Never seen a pilot, um, you know, even after the day when I was in leadership roles at various companies and watching so many, you know, pilots because who can all navigate, which is skill, but he never had to back a vessel hard ever in his flanking maneuvers. He was just a step ahead, no matter how big the tow, no matter how heavy, able, to, no matter what the current was, be it Memphis gauge, Cairo gauge, um, just a flanking acumen extraordinaire. So I was humbled to be able to learn from some of the better pilots because another saying I've always applied, um, all captains are pilots, but not all pilots are captains. At the end of the day, you have to be able to navigate these vessels and um, what they do with such skill. Um, for some, 
It's not easy. And Captain Payton was one who could just really had mastered the art of navigating and the skill of navigating the vessel long before we had um, simulation training. Well, what was your favorite place to run and why? Well, I, I loved Lower Ohio, to be honest. In Lower Ohio, it's just scenic, um, majestic, um, coming down through some of the national forests with the cliffs, um, be it summer, spring, um, or fall, just tranquil, um, just beautiful. Um, some of that time I, I, I miss. I can remember sometimes going out uh, whenever I was on deck and just, we were still allowed to do that and ride the head of the toe just for the quietness of the being on the head of the toe and and looking at the scenery and then navigating. I love night operations. I was running at night. You know, we Americans do that everywhere we go. Um, we're great at night, be it navigating our rivers, um, night operations for the military. Um, and I, I love the backwatch, love running at night. Any other highlights of your career at the Sticks? Um, maybe a low light whenever I decided that I um long bottom bend. I was coming down with a um unito and I thought that I could um steer when I should have been flanking and thought I had I got this and um really kind of um put a big slide into the toe and we kind of wiped out on long bottom bend right at the on the right descending shore, I'll never forget it. When I realized I was out of room, tried to jack it around and just put more of a slide into it. And so I learned how you put a slide in that had already been turned loose. And uh, that was maybe the little light that was a highlight. You know, flank where you should be flanking and don't try to let your ego get ahead of what you uh, really should allow the vessel to do. The good thing is, I guess back in those days, you didn't have a Coast Guard inquiry and they didn't come out. It was just, you just kind of banked your back up off the rocks and away you go and keep on going. You know, your crew goes out, make sure nothing's leaking, nothing's damaged, away we go. Um, so um, that innocence was um, was um, the way we were in so many things, but I think that the way we have evolved to become better stewards of the river, um, of our assets, um, it was only inevitable that we had become um, more cognizantly aware, aware of making sure that we do care for the river, care for the banks, care for our, our, our assets, not pollute. I mean, there was days when we would, if drip pans were full, there's one way to empty them. Just open the scupper and away it went. Well, we don't do that anymore, and for good reason. So um, the evolution of the industry, which is why I'm so passionate about that, we are good stewards to the to the environment, to um, not only rivers, but you know, we're looking to upgrade our, our pollutants by making our emissions come into control. We're still the greenest industry, as we know, and we're and trying to improve on the upon that every day. Um, in lieu of our competitors, be it rail or truck, to be green and to be respectful for the environment that we um, um all operate in, and that we all hear about climate change. So, um, it starts with us being the best we can be each and every day. Absolutely. So after this time is when you go into shoreside roles, correct? Correct. So, and your first was traffic assistant, you said? Yeah, traffic assistant, that's correct. Fill me in a little bit on that job, and I guess uh, your next few steps. Yeah, that job, um, traffic assistant, was um, I was a liaison for the Waterways Freight Bureau. Because at that time, um, for a nation, we had tariffs. And so all the movements of cargo, regulated cargoes, which were those commodities that could be counted in piece or by unit, such as a steel coil, steel wire rods and 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 break bulk commodities not not bulk commodities like coal or sand or aggregates which are break bulk true break bulk these are commodities that you know can be counted in peace and hard count containers all that's called regulated commodities and there were tariffs tariffs established the um, rates that would be charged to the shippers from point a to point b and what the water race freight bureau did was basically go and the bureau was consistent of all of the member companies um, that were transporting. Um, so all the major barge lines belong to the WFB, Waterway Street Bureau, would submit their traffic um, uh, as far as 
the amount of cargo moving from point A to point B, then by that, we would go and do our work to understand how much freight is moving, tons of freight moving, and you established a rate. And so my job was to collect that data for our company and then go to the bureau as a representative to walk, work with the other traffic assistants and traffic managers um, to then dis determine what rate would be fair between those two points. And that was established from all points across the inland waterways and coastal waterways. Um, then we'd have to have a public um, notice um, and put out that, you know, this tariff rate might be losing traffic hypothetically. So we're going to increase those rates, have a public notice, have a uh, little session in Washington, invite all the shipping public in. They would come in to protest. We were already ready to, you know, approve it, go through the process. They would protest. We would approve. And the chairman, who was Alan Carling for many, many years, uh, would say, okay, thank you for all of your commentary. Bang the gavel, rate will take effect as published, invariably. I think one time in my tenure, short tenure, that we see one that was rejected and was sent back. Um, but those were the regulated days. Um, and then through deregulation, the traffic assistant, the traffic managerial um, roles were eliminated because we went from um, everything being regulated by the um, those commodities to contract carriage, where now each carrier um, and the shippers were now able to establish their own rates um, individually. Um, so that was a big change for not just uh, the maritime, but also that was happening with um, rail and truck and airlines. I mean, a lot of people don't make that connection, but deregulation happened against, against um, and what happened in conjunction with all modes of transportation, which was air, rail, trucking, highway, and ourselves. So it was a huge change. Uh, we saw what happened from airline rates that went from, say, $1,000 from Pittsburgh to Boston to $200 um, because of contract carriers, new carriers coming in. Well, the same type of effect happened in the maritime and barge industry. Rates that were established by tariff that were $18 a ton, just going by as an example, fell in contract carriers to maybe 3 or $4 a ton. So it was a drastic change. So a, a lot of companies had to go through a major change of how they did business, learn how to do business differently, and a lot of consolidations, a lot of um, just changing of the industry started right at the time of deregulation. And roughly what year would that have been? I knew that question was coming, Tim. Again, some timers. It was probably in the early 80s is when that really started and it really hit full. I should have marked that date, but I'm going to say early 80s. It was about time of deregulation. Easy enough. Yep. So where did your career go next? From there, I, I, I worked uh, in sales and worked, um, uh, ended up being transferred to New Orleans for the first time. Um, and in New Orleans, I was working with our um, operations um, there because we had a major fleet there. We had fleets all over the country. So really um, started working with a Section 4 freight forwarding company, a division of ours, River Forwarders. River Forwarders was a Section 4 freight forwarder, and we were taking in um, less than barge loads to create a barge load. So you had a lot of import commodities coming in, steel products and other products and they only had maybe 500 tons, 400 tons, 300 tons. So we would bring all those loads into uh, a full barge load of 1,400 tons. So it was really fun working with a lot of um, major importers from around the, um, the globe that were bringing their commerce into Port of New Orleans and or Port of Baton Rouge and or Port of Houston. So we consolidated those into make a full barge load by giving them less than barge load um, tariffs. So that was my main job there. Um, and then lo and behold, um, for Jero, we changed, became a different company, National Marine, and then eventually the company moved its headquarters from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. So they kind of like, I went down as a scout, and next thing you know, the headquarters came down to follow me. Um, that's my version, but the, the, it, it was different, of course, in reality, but it was, it, was, it was a fun experience. What did you think about New Orleans, and uh, how different was that from what you were used to? 
Well, big difference. I mean, the first difference was um, in Pittsburgh, my whole um, time there, as far as, you know, of age, last call for alcohol was at 1.30. And in New Orleans, 24-7. That was the first major difference. And the food. I mean, nothing like great Creole uh, New Orleans cooking, to say the least. So um, the cuisine, the little, um, we called them crayfish. When I was a kid, and we had a creek behind um, our house in Swickley. We go catch the crayfish, put them in a bottle, watch them till they die in a mason jar, put some holes in the top when they die, threw them back in, and had a little pets. Go to New Orleans, they're eating these things, these mud bugs. Like, and I had never heard of that before until moving to New Orleans. So different cuisines, different lifestyles, and just wonderful. And then, of course, the people, fantastic. How long were you down here? I was in New Orleans. Um, two times in my career um that was um for probably five years first time then i left to go um from there was transferred here to chicago and then from chicago was overseas for a number of years and then came back to new orleans so i was in new orleans twice in my career but um kind of made some steps in between well let's chat through each of those steps so what did you think about life as a salesperson um, it was great. I mean, it got a chance to really work with the um, um, the product owners um, and find solutions for their challenges and moving their commerce, um, keeping them competitive. I mean, and doing the river forwarders work and the freight forwarding work, um, we were creating what we called then through Bill of Ladies. And I think it was the first time um, that we were creating a, a, a through Bill of Ladies that included the barge component the actual um, stevedoring transload from ship to barge um, and the carriage from terminal uh, upon destination and the delivery to the plant. And we called that a through bill of lading. Um, so that was the, the first advent of creating um, a value add to the customer where he didn't have to go and put everything together. We were actually doing that for them. There was some risk involved because you're bringing other modes in, but you know, through um, our legal department, we ought to make sure that we protected each of those um, different interchange points. It was very effective and it was value add. So um, it was a great model and it was fun because that gave me the opportunity to work with other modes of transportation more directly, as well as meeting the needs for um, our customers who are looking to move their commerce from, say, New Orleans or Houston to, let's say, Crawfordville, Indiana, or to wherever it may be away from the river. Because think about the rivers. You load a barge, offload a barge, where the product is going to go somewhere, be it finished goods, uh, in between goods, or break bulk goods. So that river destination is not necessarily, at times, the final destination. It has to go somewhere to be used for something. So that was fun. Did you remain in sales on the jump to Chicago, or was that a, a career change? That was a career change. I um, Coming to Chicago, I was doing sales work as well, but I was also doing fleet work and harbor work. So I got more involved with understanding fleet operations um, and serving um, the barge line customers at this point in time. So it gave me exposure of being able to understand the needs of giving um, the barge lines the opportunity to, to bring their equipment in. Because in Chicago, we have these famous bascule bridges that have low clearance of over 19 feet. So a regular size 50 or 60 foot tall vessel can't come into the inner Chicago Harbor, and we have to have specially hydraulically um, fitted vessels that can actually take the barges into the whole inner Chicago Harbor and up to the Great Lakes, um, Lake Michigan. So it was a it was a different operation and and uh, one that you know here too was rewarding because now you're serving um, at times the um, companies you're competing with because the fleets were open. And we serve all the barge lines, as I do here today with um, Canal and Illinois Towing. We serve um, the barge line industry. So it's, it was doing something back then that now still is paying dividends and still ongoing to this day. Any highlights or lowlights of your time up there? Uh -huh. I see you captured the lowlights. You like the lowlights. No, highlights here, I mean, are just the fact that, again, service. Um, providing a value-added service for our our customers, as far as the barge lines, who are providing value-add services, you know, for um, the industry. I mean, there's still a big need. I mean, I think um, it seems like at times, um, you know, we're kind of the quiet industry, industry, if you will. I mean, 
when we're kids, right? We get little Tonka trucks. We all know about trucks. Um, we all get, you know, a little Lino train or, you know, nowadays I think like my son, you know, Thomas the train is, you're just so ingrained to understanding, you know, those modes. And then what do we get? We get a little, we have a little um, ship and that's called maritime, but we don't really understand the shallow draft in the brown water community um, at, at all. And so, and the vital importance of the freight that we move on this inland waterways. And if we weren't there, certainly our country would know it. And the value add of our, I think, and I've always said our competitive advantage to the world is the simple fact that by having these modes and how they work as a network between highway, rail, inland barge and coastal barge and everything that we do with moving commerce by maritime, that's our competitive advantage to the world. And having been blessed to live as an expat in South America, as they are trying to replicate what we have and doing exploratories into China and Africa, I mean, it truly is for me, it is our competitive advantage to the world. And having lived there, they're all trying to replicate what we have. So it's important that we continue to educate our elected officials. Um, like General Patton once said, either you lead, follow, or get out of the way. So it's important for us to tell our elected officials, this is why it's important to have infrastructure and holistic infrastructure bills that maintains our competitive advantage to the world. Because China and others are certainly trying to replicate what we have. Indeed. I was uh, intending to get to the topic of South America, but what was next after Chicago for you? Well, after Chicago, I think... Um, I kind of jumped jumped ahead, right? Because it all kind of goes together for me. Um, you know, Chicago, um, I was back in New Orleans um, at corporate, um, and then from there to South America. Um, and when I went back down to corporate at that time, it was, again, working in, in traffic um, and sales. Um, and kind of a segue from the freight forwarding, uh, but not with river forwarders, but doing a lot of the same work with um, intermodal. Um, and that's what made me a candidate to be asked to go to South America. And from there, I was transferred to um, South America. And what was the job down there and how long were you down there? Total years, um, about 15 years. Um, and the job, the first initial job was in Venezuela um, before Chavez and before um, we had anything called you know, Modero. Um, Venezuela was trying to um, do the same thing that any country is trying to do is to, to become more efficient and to utilize their inland waterways. They had the Orinoco River. They were not utilizing it. They had bauxite smelting plants um, in Puerto Ordaz, which was basically their Baton Rouge by location um, on their river, the Orinoco. Um, so we had bauxite, we had uh, aluminum smelting plants, and all the bauxite was being imported into the country. Then by going up the Orinoco, a mere 700 uh, miles, lo and behold, they had bauxite in the ground. So now the challenge became, how do we get that bauxite down to uh, the ports? And Jerobe, an engineering and consulting firm, uh, connected the dot by saying, hey, what you can do is you can... Um, you know, utilize your inland waterways. So we had to um, go and, and do exploratories. I was nominated because of my background uh, at sea and on waters, plus managerially. Hey, we've got a cat that could probably put all those things together. So went down um, an exploratory and we were on a, a basically a little um, shanty vessel sounding and trying to determine can we even navigate this river through the low water and high water season? So that was the first introduction. And then lo and behold, yeah, we were able to do that. And then we said, well, yes, utilize these same type bars we do here um, and, and brought those down and then started them and educating and training them how to um, navigate and, and do this work. So that was, that was the first um, opportunity. It worked out quite well. And is all that still happening today? It does. It still happens to, to this day. It's not certainly at the same magnitude as it was when we left it. And because everything ended up being nationalized and we um, sold out and it was changed over through several hands. But at the end of the day, long story short, it was nationalized. 
and Venezuela has just been in such dire straits um, with all their industrial components uh, because U.S. Steel was there long before us in the 20s um, and established Puerto Ordaz as a city when they were bringing out iron ore from Puerto Ordaz here to the United States for um, U.S. Steel's you know, steel making capabilities. So all this industrial might that they have from all the basic materials they have from iron ore, bauxite, um, they have forestry, um, they have bauxite um, and coal. I mean, just so many natural resources. It's all taken um, a really, oil, of course, big OPEC nation, can't forget that. Um, really taking a step back because of mismanagement and lack of investment um, and just the way that the um, government has been managing um, not just the, um, the industry, but the people and society. It's really sad to see, um, given everything they have um, and where they are today. And we see so many Venezuelans who are illegally trying to migrate and leave that country. And for good reason, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a disaster. It's, um, when I lived in Puerto Daz, for an example, there was a major development of Puerto Daz. It was growing and investing malls and sh shopping and what uh, we call here Jewel Osco, our, our grocery stores, just as big, just as nice there, full of, I mean, everything. There's a regular grocery store, just like going to Jewel here in Chicagoland area um, or Giant Eagle um, in Pittsburgh where I grew up. And seeing recent pictures over the past few years, two, three, four years, those stores are empty, literally empty. Um, power um, is all over the board. Um, and people who are just dying because of lack of medicine, lack of um, resources, lack of food, it's, it's just it's sad. So a um, lot of things that were there um, are operating, but by no means to the standard they should be. From every entry that I just named. Well, what was your next task down there in South America? We went into Argentina, did the same thing there on the Paraná Paraguay. Now there they had a history of navigation on their riverway, so it wasn't starting from completely greenfield. Um, the difference was their industry was just really um, behind. Um, there again, we're night. Out and we're night operators. So, to give you a comparison from Buenos Aires up to the headwaters, which is Curumba, Brazil, which made it an international voyage because you're going into Brazil, Paraguay, um, Argentina, and Uruguay, which is the Paraná River. And the Paraná then turns and goes to the west into Brazil and confluences with the Paraguay River that goes on up into Brazil. A lot of grain, a lot of iron ore, which is the equivalent distance from, say, Curumba, Minneapolis, all the way to Baton Rouge, New Orleans. We do that trip in how many days? We could do that trip in 20 days, 25 days. They were doing that trip in 70 days, 80 days when I arrived. There's nowhere close. Um, and sometimes 90 days. So no night operations and lack of discipline. So what we did was just do what we do um, and educate and train and develop and bring over U.S. Um, type of vessels and, the, and barges and assets, make efficient streamlined tows once we realized we could do it, um, and then turn that operation into 24-7, seven days a week, 365, and brought that trip down to equivalent standards that we see today here, 15, 20 days, which was revolutionary for them. So again, um, unlike Microsoft, I always say, or other, you know, uh, high tech companies that can just put out V2, V3, and V4 and, and make a fortune, we had to do some boots on the ground hard work to just change a culture by this hard work, discipline of re-education, demonstrating the ability to be able to actually navigate um, and then efficiently load, offload, it's everything that we take for granted, training a, a nation and nations how to be more efficient and how to be more disciplined in their execution of their operations. And that was a wonderful experience. Giving back to a country that was hungry to do it, 
uh, once we do that here too, eventually the Americans leave. And so is it still going on today? Probably. Is it as efficient as it was when we were there? Probably not. Well, I've heard from some other guests in previous episodes about the export, I guess, of old barges, old boats down to South America. Were you involved in building fleets and capacity down there? Yes, very much so. In both countries, in the Mercosur and well, Venezuela, um, with Travo, um, we did some construction, and then we also contracted some uh, other shipyards. We used um, John Vickers out of Greenville, um, and also um, purchased some of his the vessels he constructed um, for us to take down. So we, it was again um, bringing the assets to do the job, and then training, educating um, the locals how to utilize them, how to you know um, maximize the efficiency. Of one 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 funny story, and um, in Venezuela when we got there, there was one boat, regular towboat, and I forget who they. I think it bought it from Dixie Carriers. Can't remember exactly, but um, point is. They had a boat and they were using it as a tug. Like we use tugboats for docking ships. That's all they use a towboat for. So one, they had the wrong boat for docking ships, but that's what they were doing. And it had regular hydraulic, you know, steering and flanking rudders um, and, and controls. So they recognized that these little short stubby um, handles on top of the rudders they really needed were in the way. So they just took them off and never used them, never even knew what they were for. Just took them off. It was kind of funny. Like, well, you need those. And there's a purpose for that. And um, the owners didn't even know what they were to be used for. So that gives you, we were, you know, we were at elementary level of education to change a culture of how to become what we are. Any idea what sort of barge capacity or the, the, the fleet, maybe the barge fleet in the in each country was when you left? Well, that's a good question. Am I, I am... Um, I'd be guessing. It, it, I would say that we increased the overall capacity. Well, Venezuela, it went from zero to, we left probably 300 to 400 barges there. So that's Venezuela, easy answer. Um, the Mercosur, a little more difficult, but I would say we probably increased the capacity between ourselves and others who were involved. And, uh, and now today there's even some foreign um, countries that have invested. But when I was there involved, probably two, 300% increase in capacity, easy. Because once we discovered efficiencies, well then more came to the table. Cargill was always there. Um, ADM was always there. They had a long history of being in, in, in South America and Cargill too wanted to be able to utilize um, the river system. ADM wanted to be able to utilize the river system. Bungie is an Argentine company. Uh, founded in Buenos Aires, and they do a lot of work here in the United States. All the multinational grain companies do across the planet, um, but hadn't made the connection to apply what they're doing here in their home country. Of course, we changed that dynamic too. I should say influence that dynamic. It's probably a better way to say it, right, Tim? Indeed. Were there um, any other stops in South America for you? Well, exploratories um, that were happening um, certainly in all of the Mercosur countries, um, and then visits to um, Europe to look at um, things that were happening there on their systems, um, the uh, Sine River, the Rhine, uh, Thames, um, stops to China, the Yangtze River. In fact, um, Dravo had built some barges and some boats that were still operating. Um, they built those um, really in the, in the late 70s are still operating there for coal trade um here to explore tours to look to see if there's any way to try to enhance their operations improve their operations and just consulting the thirst to learn um and into african nations um looking um in the nigeria and other countries to see again you know this is something that's you know we're the best in the world of what we do when it comes to operating in the brown water trade um, with Canal, we went and we did a project in Colombia. Um, and uh, that system, the Mangalera River, it was cheaper for um, them to uh, move a container from Barranquilla all the way to China 
can they move that same container from Bogota, their capital city, to Barranquilla? And here you had the Mangalena River that connected all through the interior of their country as well. So there were some foreign nationals who were there working, one American company. And here again, it's all about efficiencies and training, and education. Um, and we were giving them the skills, the knowledge, and the ability to enhance their operations. And again, the same playbook. Um, and so uh, why? Because there's no other um, country that's able to uh, navigate and manage the brown water trade like we do as Americans. I mean, we just, we're the best at that, um, bar none. And I say that with authority, having lived, worked, and traveled to so many inland waterway um, countries um, around the world. So as a, a competitive advantage for us, and it works. Um, we move more commerce than any other country on the planet. Um, and that's the result of the network that we've built in our capacity. Is any any uh, is anything specifically memorable about waterways that you've seen overseas, Europe, Africa, China? I think. I mean, I think. Well, I mean, obviously, I'm kind of saying that the one thing that stands out is just you know just how far behind the rest of the world is as compared to us. Um, the lack of the network between their modes in some countries they don't even have rail. For example, Bolivia, no rail. Um, uh, highways, uh, not all third world countries are third world countries. There's third world countries and there's subdeveloped third world countries. Bolivia, for example, um, their roads um, aren't even paved. And if it rains, bad day, nothing moves. Um, and no rail. I mean, there's a rail, but it's, 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 it's there's no commerce on this rail system whatsoever. Brazil was challenged in other modes of supporting um, network of infrastructure. Um, when we look to Europe, we think of Europe, sure, they're moving by their waterways. China is as well. Um, China has those assets I referenced a minute ago, built years ago from Giro Corporation. There might be something today, since my last visit's now coming from Europe, because Europeans are trying to fill that gap of building shallow draft vessels, but so different than when we built. Um, in Colombia, we saw some of the vessels that were built in Croatia. Um, they're heavier. I mean, they're the, the steel they use, the way they construct the barges, I mean, the payload is, is, is um, lessened because of just the heaviness of the steel that they use and just the infrastructure they put on these barges. It's like a floating tank. Um, so you're losing payload. So that means you're losing efficiencies. The vessels are, are different um, and don't... Um, respond like our vessels do. They look the same or similar, but they just respond differently. Again, we're the best at what we do. So I think the thing with stand out is just looking to other countries, Africa way behind. We're so many light years ahead of the rest of the world. So it goes back to let's maintain our leading position. So let's not let um, our Lack of investment become a political battle. Let's ensure that we keep investing to keep America strong and in a leading position because, the, again, the rest of the world wants to replicate what we have. And it, those are facts, not um, opinions. Well, if you uh, were to pick a vacation spot anywhere you've lived and worked in the world, where would that be and why? That's a good question. Um, well, well, I guess one for me, I, I love nature. And I would highly recommend to my, I would do it and recommend anybody, a Patagonia of Southern Argentina, Tierra de Fuego. Um, to go down to the Southern tip of Argentina, it's just a, a, a natural and a nature wonderland. Um, it's beautiful, number one. And the, the wildlife is there, it's just spectacular. Might not put it on the level of the Grand Safari of African nations, but certainly from the orca wells and the and the seals and the and the, um, the various uh, wildlife of birds um, and just just nature. It's just what a beautiful environment. Penguins. I mean, on and on and on. It's just so beautiful. 
And oh, by the way, for the skiers out there, if you're a skier, there's nothing like skiing, um, you know, in Argentina and Chile um, to really get um, um, some fun um, because there's nothing like skiing the Andes. And that's an added bonus if you go down because they're opposite seasons. So our summer is their winter and vice versa. So you can off, off season um, visit, but that's where I would go. Yes, indeed. I'm going to look into that, maybe. I, I have trouble getting north of Tennessee myself. But um, <laughs> So uh, from South America, where where was your career? Where did it go next? Well, I, mean, um, um, I went to, um, I was at ACBL in, in, in those times and, and was ended up being in um, Harahan um, doing... Um, overseeing the operations for um, our operations all in the um, Gulf South. Um, from there to Jeffersonville for a short stint, um, became the leader for all of operations. And then from there, I joined this wonderful company called Canal. And um, it was my first time really working with a privately held company and had all the respect for for Merritt and David and, and, and um, we just had some just wonderful times really being able to take advantage of some of the things I've done in my whole career that we've done here with Canal and it's, it's, it's come together. Um, and we're doing some wonderful things as far as, you know, the fleeting side, the harbor side, the, uh, you know, the part of being in Colombia um, when we formed Canal Barge International. Uh, we are doing a, a lot more as far as actually taking some of our historical unit toes and and doing some work to be able to integrate those toes. So those are, um, it's like a, a perfect um, um, ending to a, a long career, and it all coming together perfectly. So it's been it's been wonderful, Tim, and it's been um, humbling. Um, and I think in between there, there was a stop, um, being um, humbled to be a leader while I've been with Canal. Um, sitting in Washington as the chairman for the American Waterways Operating Association um, and the first minority to be elected to that um, position in the history of the AWO. And I couldn't be more humbled and um, by the fact that, you know, this industry looked upon this one kid from a corner in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, we talked about, who had to enjoy a snowfall on day one before it turned gray and sooty and, and messy um, to being able to speak with our elected officials, our senators, um, our congressmen, and influence them as to why um, what we do is so vitally important to our nation. Um, and being able to speak to them with authority of having been blessed to be um, all the places I've been. And so it wasn't just a rumor or opinion or something I heard about. No, there's things that I've seen, done, influenced, and this is why we have to be and continue to be the best that we can be and invest in our infrastructure. And and Merritt has been nothing but a hundred percent supportive of allowing that to happen. I'd like to believe that, you know, maybe a little bit, just a little, I've helped make um our industry and, and, and our nation better by being able to bring home factual evidence of why this is important and why we matter. Well, we've certainly covered the gamut. I think that's a decent enough place to stop but is there anything else you'd like to share about the industry or anything else we haven't touched on so far no i think we covered a lot tim i think um you said you wanted to kind of go from a to z i think we covered a to z i mean i think the only thing i would say is i would um you said uh, mark recommended that you know you reach out to me so i would give a shout out to mark you know again um we're an industry where you know we all know each other and we all work together and um um, there's a lot of respect, mutual respect among us as colleagues. And from those companies that are publicly traded to those companies that are family owned, um, big or small, it takes all of us. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity to be a part of and associated with so many great people um, as we continue to to make our nation better. And that's, that's it's humbling and, and it's great to be a part of it. Thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate this. No, thank you, Tim. I've been looking forward to it. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. This has been a production of Where You At Studios, LLC.